Good morning. Let's stand together and let's sing and praise God, worship. Let us hear you sing out loud. Darkness. 
Good morning from Kid Street as well. Any kids in the congregation want to make their way down to the steps for the kids' message? I'll remind you of a couple things going on in the church while they come on down. Uh, April 2nd, it's not just for kids. It's the whole church is invited. Good morning. The whole church is invited on April 2nd to join other churches around the Independence Square to the Palm Sunday Parade. So we will meet at the corner of Lexington and Pleasant. We'll leave here around 9.10 and get to uh, that church's parking lot about 9.15 where we'll receive some palm fronds and follow the donkey and make our way around the square to the courthouse. We'll have a short worship service there with all the other congregations. So it's a really good time of unity and celebration. Um, and then we'll make around, uh, you know, our way around the courthouse and come back to church. So we ought to be back here you know, a little after 9.30. So, you know, you can wait a couple more minutes for your donuts. And boy, I think I saw brownies this morning at Sunday school. I mean, you need to go to that class. They're serving brownies for breakfast. Did you know that? Yeah. Sounds like a good deal. And then on the 8th of uh, April at noon, we'll have our Easter egg hunt here at the church on the church grounds. And if we do have bad weather and it's raining, we will do it inside. So it won't get canceled or anything like that. So I'm just asking for pre-filled eggs at this point. So if anybody wants to uh, help the Easter Bunny out, um, just bring those to church before... Uh, that Saturday before Easter, and uh, we'll help the Easter Bunny out that way. It, good morning. It's good to have you guys here. Um, we're talking about I am. Jesus says a bunch of I am's in the Bible, and uh, Pastor Kevin's going to be talking about I am the gate, right? So a gate lets you in the backyard. Do you guys have pets? Yeah. So if you leave the gate open, does the pet run away? Yeah, or you let the pet out to go to the bathroom, come back in, right? Yeah, he doesn't run away. That's a good, that's a good pet. Yeah, if my cat gets out, boy, we have to chase it all over the place. She'll come back eventually, right? But, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about a toy like this. Do you guys ever play with a yo-yo, right? So if, uh, you know, if you let it go, it follows the string. It's supposed to go back to my hand, right? Well, what would happen if I didn't have the string? Somebody want to cut it for me? Here. You have so many yo-yos. Yeah. All right, so the string got cut. What's going to happen when I let go? Is it going to come back to my hand? No. Oh, man. Right? There it goes. Yeah, you got to have the string, right? So Jesus says, I'm the gate, right? Follow me, 
right? I will show you the way. So Jesus is like that string on a yo-yo, right? God lets us go. He lets us make up our own minds. He makes us, he helps us, you know, make good decisions, but it's up to us, right, to make decisions, right? Hopefully, when we are connected to Jesus, right, when we follow him, when we ask Jesus into our hearts and be the Lord of our lives, right, we return back to the hand of God, right, that created us. So just think of a yo-yo during Pastor Kevin's sermon. He's not a yo-yo. Just think of a yo-yo, okay? <laughs> All right. Will you bow with me? And then we will worship the Lord that is our way. You can keep it. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for your son Jesus who shows us the way, who gives us entrance into your kingdom, who is with us now and will be with us forever. Help us to be an example and have us help others find their way to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to stand and sing and worship together. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine.
king I may live in a palace too tall with great riches to call my own but I don't know a thing in this whole wide world that's worse Let's pray. Father, thank you for everyone gathered here together today in your name. Hear their prayers. Lord, take what we give back to you today and use it. Um, also, we would like very much for you to open our hearts to each other and to your word and to Kevin's message. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Bibles with me if you would. John chapter 10, continuing in our series, Jesus telling us who he is. You can see on screen, Jesus says, I am the doors. So we're going to talk about that today. While you're turning there, a reminder of the women's Bible studies we're offering. You can see those Wednesday, March 29th in the morning or March 31 in the evening. So those of you that might be open for that, let me encourage you to try it. Just trying to do something, give women some opportunities for discussion and fellowship. So you can see those on in the bulls. And open your Bibles. John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the door. As always, we begin with prayer. A time for you to have an opportunity to talk to God face to face. He stops everything just for you. So take advantage of it if you would. I'll give you a few moments of silent prayer where you're seated. I'll close. And then we'll look at this passage together. Would you bow with me, please? Father, again, we thank you for your presence, for an opportunity to worship. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to live in this day and time when we can worship in safety and comfort. We thank you for the great blessings we have on this earth and in this nation, for the way you've worked to bless us and give us wealth and food and safety. Thank you. We thank you especially for the life that we have in Christ, our salvation, of course, eternal hope, your indwelling spirit, your word which teaches and encourages us. Thank you. And Father, we pray this morning you would be with us as we worship. Open our hearts to the moving of your spirit, to the teachings of your word. We pray, Father, that you would show us in what ways our lives could be improved. Reveal to us the sin in our lives that we aren't aware. Change us, Father. We present ourselves to you moldable in your hands. Help us to be like Jesus in every way. We know that there are many who struggle. We pray for those that are here today, for those in our congregation that are not present. Be with them all. For those that are struggling to keep their families together, help them to be able to do that, to work out the differences and give them hope. We pray that you would help people find jobs when they need them, to keep the jobs they have. We pray for those that have lost loved ones. Give them comfort. In this country, we are divided over so many things. Help us, Father. We pray for our elected leaders, those that have power over us, that they might be given wisdom and discernment and an ability to see through the mass of false information that they might act on the truth. We pray, Father, for our elections that are coming up and all the things that we're going to hear. Give us wisdom and discernment, too. We pray, Father, for our leaders, for those in office, that, they would help, that you would help them to do their jobs in ways that can best serve people. We pray for our soldiers, first responders, and our families. Use them and protect them in their service. We pray that they could save lives and help those that struggle. And Father, we pray for those that are at war around the world. Syria, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Ukraine. Help us, Father. We seem to have an inability to get along. Give us guidance there. Teach us now from your word. Help us to allow you to change us where that's needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On screen is an old picture, and uh, you can't hold me responsible for the picture's quality. It's about 30 or 40 years old. This is from an old early Army enlistment campaign, Be All You Can Be. You remember the jingle because they played it incessantly on TV back in the 80s. It was one of the most successful military campaigns ever for enlistment. And not only that, it is recognized, I didn't know this, this is one of the most effective 
campaigns in advertising in human history. It was so effective. That be all you can be thing struck a chord with people and the young people realized that they wanted to make more of their lives and this seemed to be a way to do it. So they had these massive enlistments and carried our military through some very difficult times for the next two or three decades. Things have struggled and for the last several years they've looked for different campaign emphases, something that would do better. And then they came upon this great slogan, next screen please, be all you can be. Still, the new campaign is the old campaign. They did several small ones in between, didn't seem to work. So they did a lot of polls as, as advertisers do and they found out that young people wanted their lives to mean something. Not only that, they wanted to be able to do something with their lives that would allow them to be happier and more fulfilled. Isn't that interesting? So this one phrase, be all you can be, seemed to help people connect in different generations with the idea that they want their lives to be better. They want their lives to mean something. They want to have a purpose. They want to have what we would call an abundant life. And interestingly enough, this is in a culture that has everything. And we have just literally millions of younger folk who were struggling to find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in this life still even though we have everything there is that common need for fulfillment isn't there I wish I could say this is a recent development but it isn't we have always wanted to be more than we are we collective humanity have always struggled with finding meaning and fulfillment in life and Jesus understood that he understood the angst of his day and of our day and so in the passage you're going to read, he addresses that very strong and felt need for fulfillment and abundance in this life. So follow along if you, if you would. In John 10, I'll read the first 10 verses, Jesus talks about offering the abundant life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what these things were with which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he should be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus talking to a crowd of people that understood what hard life was. I know that we have struggles in this culture. We know that people in our culture are struggling with mental health and emotional health and anxiety and stress and all those kinds of things. We might need to do a little bit of history to give us some perspective. In Jesus' day, the haves were the Roman government. The have-nots were literally everybody else. The have-nots literally struggled for food every day. They wore the bare minimum that they could afford when they worked, they worked a long day, generally 12-hour days, that was the norm. Seven days a week, that was the norm. And they hoped to get paid that night because if they didn't get paid that night, they couldn't feed their family that night. And it was like that forever. They had never known anything else. And they struggled for life. Not only that, there was no hope that things would ever change because the Roman government that was so oppressive that taxed them at an 80% level that literally planted soldiers on every corner in every conversation monitoring everything you did. They were the most powerful military on earth and there was no hope of overthrowing them. And to those people, they needed to hear that somebody could help them. So Jesus began talking about the sheep and the shepherd and how he was the door and he began to talk about the sheep needing a shepherd and he portrayed himself as that shepherd that could lead and how when people found him they would know his voice and follow them and they didn't get it so if he finally said listen I am the door 
And if you follow me, I'll give you abundant life. And they understood that. And Jesus presented a message that if you follow me, if you base your life on my teachings, if you trust me, I can help you in this life. He did not promise an overthrow of the Roman government. He did not promise easier times. He did not promise anything that would change in their situation except for the fact that when they lived a life according to his teachings and when they trusted him with their lives, that their lives would be better. That they would have this thing called abundance. So what we want to do is look at this passage a little bit and see that Jesus is the door that leads to life and, and try to figure out exactly what he was talking about. If you would look at verse 9 again. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he should be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So this is the simple explanation for Jesus. If anyone will follow me, they will be saved and find pasture. So those two phrases are important. They shall be saved. People understood there was something wrong. We're sinners, and that's, that's the religious explanation for what is wrong. I talk to people every day, and so do you, and I watch the news, and I wonder what in the heck is going on, right? Because we see our government that does these things, and we see our people that do these things, and then we watch ourselves do these things, and we know we're going down the wrong path, and we know we're not doing right, and we know we're struggling, and we see people struggling, and we wonder what in the world is going on. And Jesus looked at people who were struggling against an oppressive government who had no hope of change and he said if you follow me you'll be saved. Jesus understood something and we sometimes forget. The core issue of humanity is their separation from God. Not the fact that they don't have money or they don't have an easy life or that there are problems. Everybody struggles and those are struggles of everybody with every age and every generation. The core issue for humanity, the thing that causes us the most grief is the idea that we are separated from the one who created us. We're sinners, yes. That doesn't mean we're bad people, but we choose a life that is separate from God. And even when we go to church, there is something wrong within us. And so Jesus said, if you follow me, you shall be saved. So that was the core issue. If you follow me, if you receive Jesus as Savior, you shall be saved. And what that means is very simply, that Jesus can come in and, and cleanse you of that emotional baggage that you're dragging around and take that thing of guilt that's left over from old stuff and cleanse that and give you another chance. You look at your life, and this is a message that you can share with your family and friends. How you are now doesn't have to be how you are in five years. What you did 10 years ago doesn't have to drag you down today. You know, and we do that. We tend to hang on to old stuff and we can't seem to get rid of it. And you know, there's all sorts of self-help and those kinds of things. And Jesus understood that people are always the same. First century people were just like us in so many ways. Circumstances were different. But Jesus understood that what they really needed was salvation. And that's the core issue. You receive forgiveness of sins. God begins to work within you. The Bible teaches us that when we receive Jesus as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to work. He heals you emotionally and spiritually. He enables you to move on from those things that hold you down, the guilt and other things that I've mentioned. And he begins to teach you. Teach you to change. Teach you to live differently. I think of kids and their parents all the time just because, uh, you know, I, I stand there and watch the mamas fuss with their, grandchildren, with their babies coming into child care every day. And I say, almost say grandchildren because a lot of grandmas bring their grandbabies and that's a thing anymore and you know that. And they're struggling against these little, little wonders, bundles of joy. And I hear this and mama says, don't slap me. And don't you slap me again. Stop slapping me and on and on and there's this sweet little baby. She's sweet. He's sweet. They're all wonderful gifts of God and they have to be taught how to act, don't they? By nature, they try violence to get their way and I don't want to overblow that. They're not destroyed kids, but, but they're kids and they have to be taught how to act. 
Talk to teachers, people who work in schools. They will tell you somewhere along the way this generation of children has missed something. Well, what they've missed was children teaching them how to act and how to express your emotions, all those kinds of things. And Jesus understood that people needed to be taught how to live because if you live in a way that comes naturally, you will destroy yourself. And you see that. So Jesus said, if you follow me, you'll be saved and I can teach you because this salvation thing in the presence of the Holy Spirit makes you pliable in God's hands. And sometimes people don't understand that. God wants us to change. He loves us as we are. He accepts you as you are. But he knows you need to change. Just like those mamas love those little babies that just slap them in the face. But those babies have to grow up, don't they? They have to be taught how to act. They still love them. But there has to be teaching and training and disciplining. So Jesus says, I'm the door. And if people will follow me, they shall be saved. They'll receive the Holy Spirit. And life right now will begin to change for the better. Now, like I said, you notice, Jesus did not promise your circumstances will change. The things that Jesus can do is internal. He changes our perspective. You have noticed this. He can talk to your neighbors. One neighbor has a nice house, a nice job. They're all healthy. And all he does is complain and gripe about his miserable life, right? And then you can go down the street and find another neighbor who has a nice house and they're healthy and a good job. And they can't say enough good about their life. What's the difference? It's their perspective and how they look at life. Jesus can change us. He can help us to have a different perspective regardless of circumstances. Now sometimes God will work to help us change circumstances, but don't count on that. Instead, begin to understand that the abundant life comes from within. There are people all over the world, literally, that have very little. And that they experience this abundant life that God can give. The other idea here, they shall have abundant, they shall be saved and have green pastures, meaning they will begin to experience a sense of fullness in life. It never ceases to amaze me when I hear stories and testimonies of people who come from hard times that they're pretty happy. Not always. They're sometimes miserable and I understand that. But a lot of times there are Christians out there in miserable circumstances and they don't complain a bit. And they're thankful for what they have. You see, it's something that with, is within you where you are taught and you allow the Holy Spirit to shape your perspective and God helps you to be thankful for what you have. I think of this often when I think my life is worthless. You know, and I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I, I wake up in the middle of the night a lot and my hormones are raging and I don't understand any of that. But when I wake up in the middle of the night, I am discouraged with my life and think I'm a failure and think, you know, that I've got to do something. My life is terrible. And I've found that if I start doing that count your blessings thing. Remember that old song? Count your many blessings, name them one by one. You know, that works. You know, that's a very Christian thing to do. Counting your blessings isn't just a balance sheet of good and evil. Counting your blessings is a way of acknowledging what God has done in your life. So I start thinking of that. I've got a woman that tolerates me well. I've got kids that like me. I've got grandkids that think I'm the bomb. And all those things. I eat well, obviously. And I'm wealthy. Wealthier than most people that have ever lived on the planet. And so are you. And if we all go through that and we begin to practice this idea of thankfulness and thanksgiving, God begins to change our moods and our perspectives. This is one of the ways that Jesus can lead us to greener pastures because scriptures teach us how to think and how to be realistic with our lives because again our emotions they fluctuate with everything with, it, with sometimes hormones with sometimes diet with sometimes today and we struggle you know this you watch the news there, are, there is an entire generation of young people now struggling now because three years ago they missed a few months of school and I don't fault them at all. They're young kids. They don't know what's going on. They're terrified of life. And what they have to learn to do is look differently, don't they? Because nothing's really different. 
I mean, everything's different, but everything's the same. You still have to get up and go to school. You still have to grow up and get a job. You still have to work at relationships. You still have to buy food. And nothing in life has really changed. But for some reason, what we've been through as a nation with the COVID and all those things has changed the way people deal with life. Jesus said, all right, I'm the door. You want an abundant life. This is what you have to do. Follow me. Trust Jesus as Savior. And without changing the situation, Jesus can work in your life and change you and change your perspective and give you hope and give you courage and help you. On screen is a message. Read this passage with me. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Sometimes, and I've found myself doing this, sometimes we're critical of people and preachers who talk about getting saved all the time. And there was a time when I tried to minimize it because there were other things that were just as important. And I missed something. And what I've realized was that Jesus knew exactly what we needed. We do not need therapy. We need salvation and the way that God can work in our lives. And that's not to be critical of therapy at all. But most of us don't need therapy. Most of us need to allow God to teach us what we need to learn. Most of us need to allow God to change the way we think about ourselves. To change the way we think about our family. To change the way we think about our perspectives. Maybe even to be more thankful for what we do have. Because when we respond to God's call to follow him, then we begin to experience this thing called an abundant life. Now, Jesus drew a contrast between himself, the true shepherd, and the true door, and those thieves and robbers. Thieves and robbers were people who claimed to have an answer, but didn't. Thieves and robbers were people who offered religious artifacts for sale, or religious rituals for sale, or religious rituals for sale. See the pattern? Religious charlatans have always been the same. For sale, give me your money. That's not the answer. He said those people are thieves and robbers and that's why he was doing it because for some reason people are very susceptible to religious charlatans and false messiahs and those kinds of things. And so were the Jewish people. They had several messiahs. Christians have had several messiahs. You know, Christian groups over the centuries have appointed people and recognized people as messiah, the anointed one that was going to solve their problems. People want that. And Jesus said, they're all thieves and robbers. I'm the one that can help. And Jesus doesn't promise a changing of circumstances. He promises a change of heart. He promises a Holy Spirit that lives within us, that helps us and encourages us and nurtures us. He promises us that he will teach us as we study Scripture. And that's why Bible study is so important because that's the way God teaches us. And when we do that, Jesus says, you can have an abundant life. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. A direct step from this is the next on screen. And this is the idea that our lives and our abundance is oftentimes a direct result of our choices. So if we could go to that next screen. There we go. Our lives are determined by the door that we choose what that means is you have control over much of who you are. Right? I have this little redhead granddaughter. She's wonderful. She's full of something, I tell you. And she's having to struggle with some choices. Sometimes her choices aren't very good. But she's beginning to put two and two together. If I make this choice, and it's, it's fun because she talks out loud and she thinks out loud like little kids often do. And she will say, well, I made a bad choice and mom made me sit on the steps. Well, what choice was it? Well, I chose to hit my brother. And, you know, and she's very honest with it. And you know, violence is always a thing with little kids. And she learned, she has to learn every day seems like, but she learned that if she makes a choice to use violence in relationships, she's going to suffer the consequences. She has learned that if she chooses to yell at her mama, she's going to spend a lot more time on that bottom step. And she spends a lot of time on that bottom step. And she's having to learn over and over. But by the time she gets into adulthood, hopefully, she will have learned that very real lesson that almost always 
your life is a result of your choices. That's our whole idea of personal responsibility. One of the key teachings of the biblical message is personal responsibility that is between you and God. Your life is between you and God. Not to say that other people can't affect you. They can. But you can't affect, change that. You can't change what other people do. But what you can do, as God is allowed to work in your life, He can teach you how to deal with life. He can teach you how to respond to life in a way that's healthy. He can teach you and He can help you do the right thing. And that's where that abundant life comes from. Not because God just gives you money. It doesn't work that way. But because God allows you to live a life that allows God to bless you. And that's your decision, your choice. And people don't like it, but that's the truth. Remember the old game show with Monty Hall? With the three doors? I know some of you older folk, that's people my age and older. Remember those game shows where you had three doors? And you got to choose, you'd roll a dice or spin a wheel, whatever. And you would guess and there'd be three doors. And you got to keep whatever was behind the door. And sometimes when you opened the door, there was a goat, and that was not the gift that they wanted. And sometimes there would be a shiny new boat. Sometimes there would be a car. Sometimes there'd be a, a cold ham, a hamburger sandwich or something like that. You know, it was understood that if you made the wrong choice and chose the wrong door, well, you don't want what's behind that door. Door number one, door number two, door number three, Monty would say. Jesus wasn't talking about a game show, was he? When he said, I am the door, he was saying, choose me. Choose to follow me because behind this door is the life that you want. So we have to understand that Jesus understood life. So on screen are some ideas for personal responsibility for Christians. First one, your influencers and convictions are your choice. Are you familiar with the idea of an influencer? If you have a computer in your house, you probably are. I know the younger ones see these a lot. Influencers are people that they put themselves all over Facebook and TikTok and all those kinds of things and they want to be influencers. And there was some interesting studies just came out and 65% of people under the age of 17 think they should be influencers. Now that means these are kids, like I said, they're under 17, and they really believe that they've got their acts so together that they should be telling people how to live their lives. Think about that. They really believe it. Now, even good kids generally aren't in a position to tell anybody how to live. Most of us adults aren't in any position to tell people how to live either. But the point is that people choose which influencers to follow. No surprise. An influencer is someone that you have said, I will follow them. And you don't worship them, of course, but you listen to them. And if they say, you know, if, if you are 10 pounds heavy, you need to get rid of that fat because you're gross. And things like that. And if you don't have this particular shape and you don't wear your makeup just so or you don't act just so, then there's something wrong with you. And influencers are those people that you allow to lead you. And you choose them. No one forces you to do this. They influence you. And the amazing thing, God has given us the ability to choose our influencers. Jesus is saying, let me be your influencer. There is a passage in Deuteronomy. I'll only read just part of it. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Oh, that you would choose life that you and your descendants might live Moses talking to his people. They were getting ready to go off without him. And he was saying, listen, if you reject God's leadership and follow someone else, you'll suffer the consequences. But if you follow God, you will live. Oh, that you would choose life. Following Jesus is a choice to choose life. The abundant life, the life that is based on biblical teaching. A life that learns to ignore the influences in culture. A life where you choose your influencers very carefully. Choose Jesus as your influencer. Another thing, the Holy Spirit will help you. Read this passage with me. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, 
We mentioned this earlier. Can't hear it too much. The Holy Spirit is God's presence within you. When you receive Jesus as Savior, God moves in. It's nothing weird or bizarre, but it's not something you're going to hear anywhere else. Literally, God's Spirit comes and lives within you. And I don't know where or how. Don't have to. God's presence is with you. What that means is you are never alone. Whether it's at home in front of a screen and you're discouraged, whether it's in a hospital emergency room, whether you're driving around, it doesn't really matter where you are. God is with you as follower of Christ, encouraging you, helping you, enabling you to make good choices. So this whole idea of personal responsibility is something that's so important that God says, listen, if you will open the right door and you let me, I will come and be with you and you will never be alone. One other thing, and you can see this on screen, God can help us to think clearly. Read that verse with me, very short. We have the mind of Christ. What that means is, when we look at Jesus and saw the way he dealt with sin and resisted evil and was able to choose and make those choices that allowed God to bless him. That's the mind of Christ. That doesn't mean you know everything. It means you have the abilities to live as Christ lived. Jesus was the example, of course. Remember, he's called the second Adam. Remember, the first Adam messed up, right? Jesus is called the second Adam. He's the one who got it right. He demonstrated that, yes, you can do this. You can live a life, a life that God can bless. You can live a life where you can move on from some of your past experiences. You can live a life where you control yourself and your passions and your emotions and all those things. The mind of Christ is your ability to understand and make choices and follow Jesus. God doesn't care what kind of job you take. and He may have created you for a particular vocation, but it's up to you. He gives us a lot of freedom. He doesn't particularly care about your fashion choices as long as you cover everything that needs to be covered, right? And, uh, and that's a thing. And God doesn't particularly care what kind of car you drive or what you park in your garage or anything. You know, people ask me, what kind of car do you drive? I don't know. He just parks it next to his Harley. You know, that kind of thing. And I'm joking, of course. He doesn't care about those things. What he cares about is your heart. So when Jesus says he will save you, it means he'll change your heart. When he says he wants to help you, that means he wants to help you live. And when he promises you an abundant life, he's not talking about all the money you want. He's talking about, let me give you a life that's worth living. Where when you're 60 and 70 and 80 years old, you're not going to think, gosh, I blew this. But instead, you're going to be able to see that you have surrounded yourself with people who love you. You have invested yourself in events and lives and situations that have brought blessings to you. And you can say, I have a good life. On screen is this one picture. Let's make a deal. That's the game show that I talked about. Again, it's just a joke. It's a goofy game show. Strangely enough, when this was on TV, we thought it was good, didn't we, guys? And I know you, you young ones are thinking, wow, what a clown a show. Yes, it was. But in those days, it was wonderful. And we all understood. And we all understood the message. Make careful of your choices. Because they dramatically impact your life. So on screen is this final thought. Choose the door that is a life of devotion for Jesus. Because he really is the only one that is the true door. Everything else that promises you abundance is a thief and a robber. Only in Jesus is there the life that is worth living. Nate's going to come and lead us in a closing hymn this morning. And it's just a hymn that gives you a chance to consider... What do you want God to do in your life? If you haven't made that decision to follow Jesus, let me encourage you to do that or talk about it. Because in Jesus, there is life. There are other choices you have to make, of course. Make those in a way that will allow God to work with you. If you want to make something public, you can do that too if you'd come forward. Nate, would you come and lead us?
Glad to have you here today. So we have some events coming up for Easter. Pay attention to what's in your bulletin. And remember, for those of you that are interested in those women's ministries, to look in the bulletin and, and come and get involved and uh, meet some great people. Christy, got an announcement or two or three? I have three things I need to mention here. First of all, in your bulletin, it says you have a missions meeting on Tuesday. That was a mistake. <laughs> so you don't need to come up Tuesday for a missions meeting, okay? Uh, second of all, the Easter floral uh, will be put up 11 o'clock tomorrow morning after prayer. Uh, that's just, we're basically putting out the lilies. But, you know, if you got a little bit of time, it, it won't take long. And last but not least, David mentioned a rat, uh, Easter eggs filled with candy. And I'm pretty sure he meant to say wrapped because anymore they don't uh, like for the kids to have candy that isn't wrapped. So... Hopefully, if you're going to uh, bring up some Easter eggs filled with candy, you will wrap them. Okay, thanks. A word from Ephesians before we go out. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us to a new in Jesus Christ. So if we can do good things, he has planned for us. Amen. Have a good week.